Okay, hi everyone. I'm Dina Matar. I'm the uh, chair of the Center for Palestine Studies in uh, at SOAS and the chair of the Center for Global Media and Communication. Um, I'm chairing this um, lecture uh, that uh, is uh, going to be a presentation of a book and a project by Dr. Jessica Norty from the University of Coventry. Um, Jessica, I'm really looking forward to um, to this launch and to the talk about Algeria at a very important moment, but I'm not going to see the show. I leave it to uh, Jessica to tell us why it's important and kind of introduce the talk. Um, so Jessica is a researcher and assistant professor at the uh, Center for Trust, Peace and Social Relations at uh, the University of Coventry. She's the director of postgraduate research there. Uh, she had worked at the, or she did her research or her PhD at the European University Institute. Um, and uh, from her research came out her brilliant book, uh, Civil Society in Algeria, and that was published in 2018. Um, she's interested uh, more broadly in, you know, she's focused on civil society and uh, uh, different countries of the global south. Uh, but she's uh, also uh, broadly interested in the work of charities, civil society, um, and the relationships between Africa and Europe. And I think there is a, a program that she's associated with that she's been working on, which is the Borderlands Project. Uh, maybe you can tell us about it uh, later on. Um, but she is the country expert for Algeria to, for the uh, Bertelsmann uh, Foundation. And so uh, she she is coming to this talk with a lot of knowledge and experience, and we are looking uh, forward to hearing her. The format of this discussion, uh, Jessica will be talking for about half an hour to 40 minutes. And then uh, we will be taking, you will see on your Zoom, you'll have question and answers. So if you could kindly put your questions there um, as, you, you know, uh, as you listen and so on, and I will uh, read them out to uh, Jessica at the end of her talk, and she can answer them as we speak. Um, the session is recorded, so uh, I hope that is not a problem for people. Uh, so without further ado, I'm passing over to Jessica and uh, looking forward to hearing the talk and to um, hearing from all the participants and, and attendees uh, their thoughts and questions. Thank you. And thank you, Jessica, for coming. Thank you so much, Dina, for this very kind introduction. Um, good evening to everybody. I'm really, truly honored to be invited by SOAS to speak on a topic which is very close to my heart on civil society, on citizen engagement, young people and solidarity, and even more so to speak about this in the context of Algeria, which is, I think we all know, one of the most important countries if we're speaking in terms of global history, world history, and the Algerian struggle for independence indeed changed the whole of Africa, if not the whole world. And we would be in a very different place potentially if Algeria had not gone through that very difficult history. And on a personal level, it's particularly important to me. Um, Algeria is a, a place and also a second home to me. I have many friends who are like family there. So Chair, if you would permit me, I would just like to say a few words in Algerian before we start the, the more official presentation. So to my Algerian friends and colleagues then, Salam alaikum, misal khair, azul falawun. Dani ferhana bezef, kira natal yo malik tebi, well, bat el yedarta kila la shrasanin, ala les associations fi al jazair, while les implications fi mustagabel, fi mayakus daur shabab jazairi. Rani kedat indir had el hadma, khater kain zumala jazairin, kima antuma, eli aununi dima. Kitebi rah dedie lil jazarin, lines eli yaunu lochrin, wa yehafsuhum, wa idiru mu badarat kulium fion viraman saib. Nani talemt min antum bezef. Wa to the Algerian students here in the UK, lil talaba jazarin, eli rahum hanafi jamiat fi UK, ala yehaftukum, ala yahmikum, ala yikata min matalkum. Min fedlikum eli yahtaj mauna rani hana. And tuma rahum tahmu bezef l'akademi tal United Kingdom. Madabina nasamau elafka wal aswat takum. 
بر کلاف کم ورفچ نبر علال حب و الاحترام علی فی قلبی لکم تهی تو بزف علی سمحتونی انان حب الجزیر و الجزیر و الجزیرین My apologies to our Algerian friends for my uh, poor pronunciation and thank you so much for this opportunity to speak with you all this evening. So Chair, if you permit, I will share my screen um, with the audience. So, um, can you see that chair, is that clear? Yes, that's, that's fine, thank you. Wonderful. So, in summary, for the non Algerian speakers, I just wanted to say a very big thank you and my gratitude to my Algerian colleagues who really went above and beyond to help me to produce this piece of research. And I continue to learn from them and their efforts. I take inspiration in everything they achieve and often difficult conditions to improve the lives of other people. And secondly, I wanted to encourage the number of Algerian students who are now in UK universities and to thank them and Algerian academics who contribute so much to the academia in the UK. So this evening, I'm going to talk about this book that I published in 2018 entitled Civil Society in Algeria. I'm going to give an introduction to what this book is about, some of the main findings, and then talk more specifically as well about the peaceful mobilization in 2019 in Algeria and the role of young people within that. And then lastly, I'm going to look at the role of civil society and what implications this might have for young people and for the future. So firstly, this book, uh, Civil Society in Algeria, Activism, Identity, and the democratic process. So I want to tell you a little bit about who I am. Why am I here? Why, why am I invited to speak about Algeria? And why did I write this book? My own positionality in this research um, before moving on to some of the main findings and what the book is about. So I am British, I'm English uh, researcher. I am an outsider in Algeria. I speak French and some very basic, as you probably guessed, Algerian Arabic. But I am also deeply committed to Algeria and these questions of neutrality that you all have in your research as if you're students or um, you know, normativity within our research, how, how distant we are or whether we're insiders or outsiders obviously have huge implications and are important for us all to acknowledge and to consider. I moved to Algeria in 2007 after having worked in, the, in a number of different African countries and then European countries working with the European Union. And I was invited to go to Algiers for a very short period of time to help set up a project that had some difficulties to work on very technical issues such as procurement issues. But during that very short period of time, I became very, very inspired and attached to my colleagues and we worked together incredibly well as a team and they invited me to stay. So. From a very short three or four day trip, I ended up staying three or four years, well, three years living in Algiers and working on this project that was supporting associations across the country in many of the different wilayas, 48 wilayas of Algeria. Um, and I was able to meet with hundreds of often very small local associations that were registered regionally and support them uh, in terms of financial management and training and project management along with a team of colleagues in Algiers working in the Ministry of Solidarity with funding from the European Union to support local development associations. And so, as I believe many of you will know, the 1990s in Algeria was an incredibly difficult time and a very violent one in which the conflict between the Islamist insurgents and the state and the army shaped almost everything in Algerian life. This breakdown and the kind of destruction of, of people's everyday lives, um, a conflict which killed over 200,000 people and which many more fled and many more would also were disappeared, meant that this, the context in which the associations we were working with in the early 2000s was still incredibly difficult. And the bravery and the courage of my colleagues and the associations with whom we were working was truly, truly quite inspiring. Um, 
And the experience of these small associations often with very little support, um, as many of the European and international funders simply left Algeria in the 1990s. They, they abandoned the country, which is, I would say, a pretty accurate description of what happened. There was very, very little support to our Algerians during that time. And what would then happen during the 1990s really happened pretty much in isolation through the, through the courage and the determination of, of local Algerian associations on the ground, dealing with the trauma and trying to, to really rebuild society. So moving on from this, um, this personal experience, I then asked my colleagues at the end of the project whether they would feel it was appropriate and I could support, uh, whether they would support me to do a doctoral research on what was happening with these associations and to go back and to interview them across the country and to find out on a more deeper level the kind of impact they were having and relationships they were having with the state, regionally, nationally, locally, with people, uh, with people in their communities. And my colleagues were very supportive. So I went back and interviewed 200 associations over the following uh, four years of my PhD, and then returned to Algeria a number of times later. Noted the last research mission for this book was in 2016, um, and inter interviewed further associations. So, the main findings of, of this book then, and what this book is actually about is, is an exploration then of civil society in Algeria, of some of the historical roots. And from the pre-colonial times, you can in, read Hugh Roberts, 2014, excellent book on, on Berber government that looks at the, the, the deeper roots of organization and community life, um, particularly in the Berber regions and the Kabylia. Um, moving on to the destruction, the real destruction under colonial under the colonial period, um, but at the same time, mobilization of civil society following the 1901 French law on associations and how associations then contributed to the independence struggle. And in post-independence, very difficult conditions and the need to unify the nation under one national identity, some of the difficulties that associations then had to mobilize in, uh, in, under the FLN after 1962. But the book then mainly focuses on what happened after 1990. And in 1990, Algeria introduced a law on associations, which really did open up the space for associational life and allowed the emergence of, of many, many small associations across the country. Also opened up the political space, which then led to the conflict and following the contested election in 1991-92 and the breakdown of, um, of, of what could have been a very, very impressive reform towards democratization. Um, whereas the reforms for political parties um, had very different results. What happened on the ground with associations, and which is perhaps under-recognized, I believe, in academia, was, was significant and that this law and the mobilization of associations and civil society in Algeria at this time following the 1988 um, protests which led to this reform and to this law meant that there were associations, civil society actors who began to mobilize to form to structure in, um, in the early 1990s, a very difficult time in Algeria. So the book begins by comparing some of the figures and the numbers of associations in Algeria compared to the regions. I'm just gonna briefly show you a few graphs. I won't bombard you too much, but this is some of the, the figures when I was doing my research in 2012, just to see actually there were significant numbers of associations that had gone through all of the, the, all the boxes they ticked. They managed to get through the bureaucracy to, to, to sign up. At the time, there was no authorization to create an association and then by kind of the late 2010, so 2011, 2012, uh, 93,000 associations registered in Algeria. Obviously the figures are quite different now with the changes in Tunisia and Egypt across the region, but this was already significant, um, I believe at that time. And at the same time, as we mentioned, the kind of absence of international donors, the absence of, of European actors, I explored some of the figures and saw just how little support there was to Algerian civil society, to NGOs, to associations in, in any form at the same period. So 
this is just an example of one donor, you could expand it, it would possibly even be the figures and disparities would be even higher. Algeria only received 2 million a year from the European Union for anything to any programs on civil society in 2011, whereas significantly higher budgets in other countries in the region. And if you then break it down per capita, you can hardly see on the graph um, the Algerian bar chart because it was so low. So very small amounts of funding, a high number of associations, and then the density where these associations were. So these associations, again, obviously Algeria is a huge country. It's the largest country in Africa. Um, and the, the, the south of Algeria, the deep south of Algeria is not so densely populated. However, there were associations, active associations, cultural associations who were registered and who at this period, and if anything more densely, so you've got the, the south, which is quite heavily uh, in terms of numbers of associations. And then the north is also the Berber regions you can see in the, in the north also heavily strong numbers of associations. And yet this last map shows us then that the actual projects that were there, that were funded in Algeria, were predominantly in the north of the country. So this kind of mismatch between the amount of funding and the actual kind of presence of, of, um, of associations. So the book then focuses in more depth on two sectors. It's, um, it looks at cultural heritage associations and social sector associations. And I wanted to try to explore to a certain extent how what seemingly might be apolitical associations um, were actually making an impact and were tackling some of the root causes or challenges, political problems um, that were facing the country at the time uh, as well as other organizations which were dealing with perhaps more specifically with more inherently political problems and issues such as, as um, those related to human rights and to the conflict that was going on. So questions of national identity, of culture, of heritage, of state policy, of how do we support vulnerable people in our communities, in our societies, and also trauma and reconciliation. These were all tackled by these, these associations that I was interviewing um, individually and in groups across the country. So I took a case study approach um, throughout the book and spent significant time with a, a number of associations and interviewed them about their work, read their publications, uh, participate in their activities and events. And I just want to mention a, a few, which is almost impossible to go through all of the associations that, that make up this, this book, but I just want to mention a couple of associations in the heritage sector and then a social sector association. Um, and so the first association would then be uh, Belorizan, which is based in the west of Algeria in Oran, um, created to commemorate thousand years of the city of Oran, um, a rich, long history of this city and that they're deeply proud of, um, a combination of artists, of photographers, of architects, um, from working together with students from the university um, to think about how to protect the cultural heritage and the patrimoine of the city of Oran. And you can see some of the images of this very beautiful city in the west of Al Algeria and kind of a very strong role for young people uh, who were actively engaged in working with the, the president of this association um, to think about how we can protect and preserve a very diverse uh, sometimes contested uh, national heritage and, and how can we share this and have a debate about questions of identity and heritage protection in, in the city and the wider region. And so they did this in, in trainings, in publications, but also through mass mobilization of the community of the city. So you can see at the bottom, uh, there's this crowds of people on the 1st of May Every year, the association would organize a random name, de la culture de, du patrimoine, and they would take, in 2011 already, 20,000 people participated in this march through the city of Iran, and they had speakers and explained uh, the history and the heritage of the Jewish her the buildings, the Spanish, the French, the Ottoman, the Arab, the Moresque, the mosques, the, the whole rich diversity of our uh, or in his uh, heritage and took everybody ultimately up to the big mountain on the top of the city and then celebrated together. 
this, this diversity. And this continues in different forms, uh, in different ways every year in, in the city of Oran. Um, they also train tourist guides and try to create jobs for young people which are sustainable and they feel would contribute in a positive way to, to protecting the city. So moving south now down to Gardaia, which is at the gates of the Sahara, a very different environment, as you can see from the images. Um, so this is the Mozabit um, Berber area of Algeria once again, and the Association pour la Protection de l'Environnement de Benisken was once again an incredibly inspiring and active association back in 2007, 8, 9, when I was interviewing and working with these associations. And they created um, this organization to really think about how to protect traditional um, cultures and practices around the oasis. So this is an oasis town, they have a, a beautiful and unique culture in the Mzab region of, of Algeria, um, but obviously in harsh conditions and the need for very for sustainable practices and to also manage um, the water flows. Um, if you know, you know the floods in the desert, the, when the weds, if the rains come down from the mountains, then it's, there were devastating floods in 2013 was the last time. Um, and if these are not properly managed, then it can, it can be highly destructive for the local population. So they were using traditional methods um, to channel these waters to then use work with local kind of solidarity techniques to, to divide up the water as it came through these wide channels that they themselves reconstructed to then distribute them to the different parcels of the different agricultural, um, the farmers and the owners of the land so that everybody was had access to water and the, and the town was also protected. So they then went on to set up a, a training center, Kras, which is now still very active in the city and they're part of networks now across North Africa and the Mediterranean to, to protect oasis, to share knowledge, to share practices, um, and to train people in, in sustainable methods of farming and, and traditional practices. So moving on to the, the social se sector associations that we that we're, we were working with and that I interviewed over, over the last decade. This is the Association Eshifa. Uh, that I would like to present to you this evening. Ashifa is um, one of the most dynamic and inspiring associations that I worked with. They are based in Medea, so we've moved north now, up towards the capital Algiers. Um, so about an hour now with the new roads to drive from Algiers to Medea. But once again, Medea was an area that really, really suffered in the 1990s, that struggled incredibly with the, the levels of violence that was happening around the whole region south of Algiers, from Algiers down to Medea and Blida, um, a devastating effect on the local population and very, very difficult for people to, to do anything, let alone set up an association and meet and, and bring people together. So the Association Medea in 2003, uh, the president and another colleague met in Algiers to try to deal with uh, an issue that had spinal problems and had to travel a difficult journey at the time to try to get treatment. And they questioned the lack of resources and um, public services in their, in their own area in Medea and why even worse for children with disabilities they would have to travel a long way to get any form of um, re rehabilitation, a form of support, medical support. And so they set up their own centre ultimately in 2008. They began just by collecting wheelchairs, crutches to try to support vulnerable families in the, in the city and the region of Medea. They registered, they applied and were successful in getting a small grant, which helped them to set up the center alongside a grant from Sonatrack, the petrol company. And over a number of years, they went from 2006 where they had 500 members to 2012 when they had 5,000 members. Um, people saw that the work they were doing was well managed, was for the community, was for the population and they gave generously to this association so that they could make this project work. And I regularly go back as, as much as I can to, to visit this association and many others to try to see how, how they're getting on and if they what support they need. And they're also active internationally, trying to support in cases where there needs to be 
exchange of expertise and medical questions or there are children which would benefit from support from traveling to France or traveling to another country. They invite American doctors, the Algerian diaspora to come back to Medea and to share their knowledge. They have a, an annual conference. Um, and the book describes some of the difficulties they had in more detail in kind of trying to overcome some of the barriers in actually setting up and keeping going and maintaining some of the bureaucratic hurdles that they, they went through. But ultimately, um, this association, many others in, in Iran, in Tizuzu and in the south and in the east that I spoke to, um, managed to, to work in often very difficult conditions where there was limited trust between people and often between the states and associations just to keep going and to work for the local communities and particularly for vulnerable people um, in their in their local communities to to build up that relationship. So, in terms of just a few words of the, the kind of conclusion of uh, of the book, then, despite the violence of the 1990s, working under very difficult conditions uh, with limited trust, I argue then that these associations managed to create spaces, and that they have progressively facilitated debate in a wide area including history, culture, national identity, human rights, equality, and social justice. And they are deeply attached to the Algerian nation and identity, whilst also critical of the many problems that they personally faced and, and that they see in society. Algerian associations were still protective of the state and against external interference. And this also conditions <clears throat> the role of foreign donors this, this sentiment conditions the, the role of foreign donors in the country, and that links back also to, to the absence of, of foreign donors when Algeria really needed <coughs> support, excuse me, and, um, and links to other questions about kind of global, um, global politics and, and the need for recognition of the truth and history, which Algeria feels Europe has not yet done. Um, the book also then lastly questions certain Western stereotypes and assumptions about Algerian civil society, namely as being no more than a conservative force legitimizing and reinforcing authoritarian regimes. And this kind of focus on authoritarian resilience that we see in a lot of the academic and scholarly literature on the region, uh, I argue has missed perhaps the point to, to a certain extent that we may have missed really important developments or as, as if Bayat argues is this concept of non-movements where people use everyday practices to challenge political authority and this kind of ignoring or overseeing of, of, of what was happening in Algeria at the time meant perhaps uh, we weren't open to them what happened uh, in 2019 last year which brings me to more recent developments um, in the context of Algeria. So I'm hoping some of you, or some of you obviously will know extremely well the, the context of Algeria. Others may well know very little about the, the context because the reporting has been somewhat um, sporadic as we were discussing before with, with Dina. What happened in 2019 was truly phenomenal. And the role of young people in particular, I think we really need to recognize and to think about and discuss. Um, on the 22nd of February 2019, millions of Algerians marched peacefully in the street to protest against the decision of President Bouteflika to stand once again for a fifth mandate, despite the constitution disallowing this and despite his own very ill health at the time, which also meant that constitutionally he shouldn't really, he shouldn't have been standing in this election. And this was seen as a, as a humiliation to the country and Algerians refused to accept this and they stood up for, for their own democracy to protect the Algerian state, in fact, um, in what's become known as, as the Hirak. And Professor Yahya Zubir describes the Hirak as a stunning development of a powerful civil society with incredible organizational non-violent skills. And I'm not going to give too much detail because I know the time is running out and uh, Yahya Zabir has written an excellent report, which you can Google if you want more information. And I've recently published an article in Revista Day, which I'm happy to share as well, which gives more detail about how this movement evolved in 2019 and why it emerged. But I'm going to just give a few elements today because to see how this links with the research that I was doing um, over the last decade with the associations and civil society. 
But the Hirag Bay has began mobilizing and marching in the 22nd of February 2019 and continued throughout the whole of 2019 with almost no violence and no divisions. Uh, women played a particularly strong role in the early mobilization. You can see here some of the images from the 8th of March, International Women's Day, in which women massively took to the streets. Every Friday, every Tuesday, millions of Algerians came together on the streets of Algiers and cities across the country to demand democracy, integrity, and a, a republic, uh, not a monarchy, as they argued. So 5th of July, Independence Day in Algeria, again, millions of people marched with this idea of protecting the Algerian state from, 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 it, from itself to a certain extent to protect their democracy and to protect, to, to fight for for what they believe the values of, of the real of the Algerian revolution. So the Hirak was successful to in its initial stages. President Bouteflika did not stand again in a fifth mandate and then stood down on the 2nd of April 2019. And this obviously continued into July and the summer as Algerians then went on to demand deeper, deeper reforms and, and a real reform to, to political life and into institutional life uh, in the country. Business elites and politicians were arrested and tried on corruption. And yet it was not just these marches. It was also a huge movement in which there were debates, artistic performance, slogans, creativity, online mobilization and media. It's it was about social justice. It was about intergenerational exchanges. You can see the image it began with the fifth mandate, but it went far deeper. It was about achieving a state of democracy and justice within Algeria. And you can also see it's intergenerational children. I mean, the young man's carrying his grandfather on his shoulders. It was, it was a celebration of the diversity of Algeria and, and a new form of organizing. So this, I want to really focus on the this kind of the heart of, of the of the of the movement, which was about solidarity, about Silmia, which is about peaceful protest, and this celebration of, of, of Algerian identity and, and the nation. So here you can see the images of the children and young people collecting rubbish and then making a making a, a beautiful artistic expression out of it, people sharing food, sharing meals. Um the the people on the bottom photo protecting the police, joining hands together, all Algerians to protect the police from any violence as well. And then a celebration of, of the different traditions and cultural her heritage of Algeria. As you can see the women dressed in their traditional <coughs> clothes in the bottom right, uh, the bottom right picture. And this idea of protecting not Algeria, protecting um, the Algerian nation itself. So this huge lesson in the civic engagement and also was about challenging kind of global injustices as well as local ones. So a lot of the slogans were then calling out the Americans and the French um, challenging the US on there's no more oil left now. If you want oil, you come for the olive oil. There was humor, there was you know, linking it to kind of the environmental protests in the south of the country that was challenging fracking and this kind of extractivist um, mentalities and approach of Western powers within Algeria and, and asking for a debate about the resources and governance in the country. So where are we? Obviously, a lot has happened since then. There was a presidential election in uh, 12th of December 2019, and in which we saw President Tabun to be elected. Um, with ongoing contestation of uh, whether that uh, election, um, Algerians are going, we're not against the election, but we, you know, they felt that the regime still needed to, there still needed to be changes and there needed to be reform. And so the march has continued at a, a lower level into March, 2020, when obviously we all then became faced with the global pandemic and Algeria closed down a week before the UK did with roughly the same numbers of cases as the UK had at the time. And I think if you go online now and compare the two cases, uh, Algeria has clearly done significantly better than the UK in managing this crisis. Um, 
you can see from the signs and the images now, the Fridays were empty on the streets of Algiers and the protesters themselves called for people to stay home and to protect the health services and to protect the health of Algerians. Um, we have the image of the man spraying the streets, but also young people came together in groups and went out and cleaned public spaces. They mobilized to, to provide meals, to set up startups in order to produce PPE, um, Ligon, masks, um, and this huge level of solidarity continued into 2020. Students went online and set up summer schools to train other students and this environment of kind of coming together and mutual support and solidarity was very much continued throughout 2020. And we're also looking now a little bit at the, the role of the Algerian diaspora in supporting vulnerable communities in the UK, as well as in Algeria. And this, the levels of solidarity and kind of civic activism um, are clearly ex extremely high, but still now uh, in the, different difficult conditions in which associations and individuals are working. So um, to try to now kind of bring this all together and back to the book and some of the arguments uh, of the book and what this, what the implications are then for, for these young people um, and for the future of Algeria. I personally believe and see from the research that I conducted that this kind of backdrop of grassroots activism since 1990 meant that there was really a, a level of social capital within these civic associations and an experience of volunteering in very difficult conditions, which meant that people were able to mobilize often very effectively. Um, and we saw in 2019, the, the certain colored vests would be then the medical support and um, this kind of high level of mobilization and, and capacity to for peaceful protests and intelligent critique of uh, local to national to global political challenges. Um, I, be, I believe that there are highly astute, internationally connected and very well educated young people now in Algeria. And I was discussing with Dina before we were in the Ecole Supérieure de la Science Politique in Algiers just January and the level of debates and discussion and the introduction now of English into the higher education system in Algeria is 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 pretty impressive and these young people now have new expectations and they want integrity of governance and i believe this is what's really of interest to the civil society organizations and to the individuals that i was interviewing this integrity of governance rather than ideology and these young people are now actively engaged so we have now a um a new research initiative working together with our university and algerian universities which is a um, youth futures program, which is about imagining the future. And this is really trying to engage now over the next few years with young people to, to interview them, to see how they imagine the future with a focus on the environment. And this kind of global questions really, which face all of us in a context of climate change, of ecological crises, which I was discussing with Algerian students this summer when their global summer schools on the environment how now do they imagine their futures in, in challenging contexts and how can we look for experiences from the associations such as APEB and Gardaia about how can we now be sustainable? How can we, we draw on these, on these experiences to, to move forward and how do they imagine the future? So in conclusion, I just have two conclusion slides and then uh, we'll, we'll draw to a close and ask for your questions. Um, Civil society actors and all of Algerians in the last years have played a fundamental role in creating this space, I argue, for debate, for reflection and action. And I want to quote uh, uh, Professor Omar Deras from the University of Iran, who spoke already in 2007 after his study on civil society and associations in Algeria. <laughs> and he argued that further reforms are needed to anchor the developments that he saw in Algerian political, social, cultural life. And if these were found, he argued, then the associate, associative movement could become a rampart against the arbitrary and against authoritarianism, allowing the emergence of an important part of civil society, not simply placing itself in a strategy of confrontation, but one of mediation in essential partnerships. And lastly, Algerian civil society and youth in particular, I argue, have shone a light on the problems of global significance. And this is unaccountability, corruption, 
and the breakdown of the capitalist model, and the rise in authoritarianism and the failure to protect our environment. And they've done this not only in protesting, but in also offering an alternative model and values. In promoting social solidarity and cultural diversity, environmental activism and a wider engaged political debate, Algerians are reclaiming their environment, their cultural and political spaces in an urgent move to reform society for a fairer and more sustainable future. And this is from a more recent article that we've just published now on the Revista Ide's uh, website about imagining a new political space. So I'm going to leave it there and hand the floor to the chair for, for your questions, comments, debates, and criticism, which I am more than open to, particularly from our Algerian friends and colleagues. And um, I hope we can yeah, enrich the debate and go a bit deeper in the questions. Okay, um, thank, you. thank you very much. So that was really a, a very interesting and exciting talk. Um, I, you know, kind of want to abuse my role as a chair and just have a, a short question, which is, um, you know, kind of thinking around your use of Bayat and the idea of non-social movements and the way that we could use that um, as uh, to show that there is a process, a continuous process of engagement with civil society and activism that kind of debunks the argument around authoritarianism because the key debates around the, the Middle East and the Arab world, particularly because of the suggested um, so-called failure of the so-called Arab Spring, uh, is that it's because of this persistent and resilient authoritarianism. So in a sense, you, you know, I just want you, wanted you to expand a bit on this argument um, that is really profound and important to make, uh, which shows that there is some form of civic or political engagement uh, taking place. Uh, so, and then I've got a few questions that I'm going to pose to you from the audience. So if I may start with that one um, and then move on to the audience, because they do have some very interesting questions. Wonderful. Yeah. I think absolutely, Dina, I mean, the question of, of this idea of continuous pro progress and engagement within civil society, I think is far more interesting and, and, and important to explore if we want to understand democracy. Democracy isn't just one election, it isn't one day, it isn't one event, it, it isn't one person, one man, as they showed in Algeria. No, it is, it is much deeper than that. It is about this the relationships across institutions and society and mentalities and, and capacity to, to change and to reform and to think and critical thinking. And so by its concept of non-movements, this kind of critique or peaking the social movement theorists or the transitologists or the kind of the focus on authoritarianism is, is, is a useful way, I think, uh, that he, he does that to, to challenge people to, to think more deeply about politics, about democratization, about reform. And the book is very much about that to try and challenge this this perspective, which I would argue, kind of, I mean, from Said's Orientalism, I mean, to consider one region is is not capable of of, of reform. I mean, it, it it makes no sense, and it, it, for me, the logic is it isn't there, and that we need to go to the grassroots level. We need all forms of research to understand our, our political context, but to doing that kind of grass grassroots interviews, qualitative research, I think allows us to to understand trends uh, and development over time. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to kind of pose the questions in the order. So the first question that came, well, first of all, uh, I just want to thank you for that very brilliant introduction and speaking in the language of the people that you are researching. Uh, that was quite moving and uh, important. Uh, and I think uh, many, many uh, of the audience were, were appreciative of that. So thank you for starting that way. It was really great. Um, so th the first question that comes is how difficult or easy was it to conduct your research in Algeria as a woman? Um, and the second question that, you know, you saw, I'm giving you two questions because there's a few of them coming up, uh, is that a question related to how Algerian identity and the nation is important to these associations. Did you find um, anything in case of the Amazigh uh, and the groups? And uh, where uh, can you say something 
uh, about whether you do have civil associations uh, amongst the MSD uh, population. And then we go to the other questions. So. Can you hear me okay? Was I, I lost a couple of the, the second question. You said, Algerian identity and nation, is it important to the associations? Could you just repeat the second part of the question, Dina? The second part of the question is, uh, how does it figure, you know, do, do, in, in the case of MSC uh, groups? Uh, and do, uh, can you say something about civil society in the MSC population? Sure. So the first question, how difficult was it to conduct research in Algeria um, as a woman? So I personally think that it was um, easier to conduct research as a woman um, because also I had uh, a lot of connections. I'd worked there for two years. People knew who I was. And it's only really thanks to those colleagues, friends and family of those colleagues that I was able to do this research because that I trusted me and they also corrected me and, and guided me in, in how to go about it in a respectful way and in a safe way, which wasn't going to add to stresses. It was still, um, still certain anxieties about people and foreigners traveling around Algeria at the time. Um, but I was, as a woman, I was invited into people's homes to stay in their families, to, you know, to weddings so I was really very much part of the community and they I was yeah I had absolutely really no problems I traveled discreetly um I hope I haven't in any way offended the Algerian authorities but I, you know I was was there as one individual PhD researcher with the support of my colleagues I'd worked in the ministry so they knew what I was doing and I traveled on the buses across Algeria from Tiret to Gardaia. My colleagues put me on the bus in Tiret and other colleagues met me in Gardaia. Um, I took taxis, sometimes with friends. Um, it's, it was, it, it's very easy if you, if you go about it in the right way and, and with the right connections and, and in a way that's respectful of, of, of local people, I would suggest. Um, I, whenever I go back to Algeria, it's very, very difficult because there are so many families and associations with whom I'm connected, who I want to spend time with, and who are extremely generous and hospitality. I'm sure all the Algerians in the audience will know that Algerian hospitality is truly uh, exceptional, and um, and the food and the welcome and that you you receive when you do go to Algeria, if you, it's slightly difficult to get the visa. That's the only, <laughs> I would say, the main challenge. Um, as it is for Algerians to get a visa to come to the UK, far more difficult. Um, and I strongly support the Algerian policy of rec reciprocity on that. But no, there were, it was, I was very fortunate to be able to conduct research in very good conditions. The topic that I was researching was one that people wanted to talk about. Um, they were happy to share their work and it was something which was positive uh, generally, despite the difficulties. And so, so it wasn't, yeah, there were no major difficulties in, in that regard. Um, in terms of how these associations view identity and the nation, and um, I think there's some really important and interesting research done by Nadia Marzuki, which you can look at her article in Middle East Studies, I think, which is um, on this idea of kind of questioning Algerian identity and and protecting Algerian identity and the state and and looking at it as a Maghrebi one and we're looking at it as an African one as an, an inclusive identity and um and one which which includes the other and which includes the transnational perspectives Mediterranean perspectives Arab perspectives Middle Eastern perspectives European African that there are many many layers and um you know, Algeria is, is a, a proud and independent Arab speaking nation and and can can benefit from many, many different forms and layers of, of identity. Um, but if the question was specifically re related to Amazi groups within Algeria, which which you you've referred to, then there's a hugely dynamic and rich tissue associative in, in Kabylia, in in the Imzab, which we saw in, in in the presentation um, 
And there's a real dynamic uh, in those regions of activism, which draws on the kind of history of the pre-colonial um, structures of Algerian society, which Hugh Roberts investigates so well in, in his book about, about that. And um, I think what we saw in 2019 as well was this kind of, <clears throat> although there were, we know there were challenges and issues and the banning of the flag, but ultimately Algerians came together to say, we are one nation. We are Amazigh, we are Arab, we are, you know, we are multilingual. We, we have many different identities, but we are protective of the Algerian nation. And I believe the vast majority of the Amazigh associations I interviewed had that perspective. I mean, there is a, a minority separatist movement, but um, that was very much the perspective that I had from the Amazigh associations that they were, they cared deeply about the Algerian nation and they were at the forefront of the struggle for the revolution in 1954 onwards. Uh, and that, that is still, still the case that there's pride in, in the Amazigh and Arab di different uh, identities of Algeria. So thank you very much. So I have uh, two questions, one from Facebook and one from um, the audience question, you know, the Zoom audience. And they are kind of related because one is asking about how do you define civil society? Are in question definitions of civil society in narrow and ideologically oriented uh, liberal notions of civil society? And then what about class? How does that fit into the, you know, kind of the concept of civil society? Um, and a related question, which is um, from Fatma, uh, saying that uh, this is a very detailed survey of the civil society in Algeria, and that uh, the question is that why didn't you mention a great number of, did you not mention the great number of associations not registered with the Ministry of Interior? Um, and then, uh, so in a sense, um, you know, did you miss out, for example, the uh, women's movement during the Herak? Uh, where a feminist group took out to the streets to ask for equality of rights and full citizenship, et cetera. Um, so I wondered whether that was, you know, you, 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 whether you mentioned these variations uh, in, your, uh, in your book uh, and whether you could respond to the question around uh, definitions of uh, civil society that you yeah. kind of use. Thank you, for, thank you for all the excellent questions. Um, first then on the definition whether Western concepts of civil society <coughs> are too narrow or ideologically oriented. I think um, it's useful for us to conceptualize and to think about these terms and to consider the different authors and scholars such as Gramsci and this kind of counter hegemonic role that civil society can play. Um, I think, and I mentioned in the book, you know, this difficulty of it transferring concepts that need to be rooted in the historical context of a country. But I think that nonetheless, it's useful to do. Like uh, Ibn Khaldun, you know, the, one of our greatest philosophers and historian sociologists of, of the world had the concept of asabiyah. Uh, I mean, how do you translate asabiyah? I mean, maybe you can say better than me, Dina, but no, this is this idea of asabiyah and the kind of generational, it, it's useful and interesting for us to, to consider in the Western context and to think about transition and change and governance and cycles, but there's no direct and translation of that concept, but I think it's useful for us to, to learn from, from different contexts. And I would argue that uh, as defined by many scholars and um, in, in both the Western world and in, uh, in, in, in the Middle East, that the concept as it's been explained in uh, and this kind of formation of different groups, associations, trade unions, uh, independent organizations as a kind of counterbalance between the state and the private sector is nevertheless um, clearly, I mean, there are active associations, organizations which are dependent, which are campaigning for change, or which are campaigning to, to protect vulnerable populations, that this is, I believe, useful in the context of Algeria. Um, but it's a, an excellent question. And question two, so questions of class and how does that fit into notions of civil society? Um, I mean, and particularly in the context of Algeria, I was, really, I mean, the, the divisions within society at the time I was studying didn't seem to be focused around class. But I think it's possibly more deep rooted than that, that it is that there are elites that profited 
um, from Algeria's resources, and these are being challenged and called out by the vast majority of the Algerian population who see themselves a different class from, from those, those groups that, that had profited. But um, there are other, I think, important aspects and, and, and kind of regional disparities that people are trying to overcome and bring people together, um, which, which are important to understand as well. And this question of not registered associations or kind of is there a civil society that, that we've missed out or that we've overlooked. Um, in the 1990s, at the time, you didn't need to have approval in principle to register an association. You needed to have your 12 members. You have the Loi de 90, the 1990 law, which set out what you needed to do to set up an association. But thanks to the lobbying of associations themselves in the late 1980s, that law was pretty, pretty open and, and allowed many, many, many associations to set up. So many, many associations were created and in principle, um, the, the, agreement, the, the, the agreements should have been automatically given to all of those associations and almost 100,000 of them did that. However, you're very right. Um, there were associations which were very politically um, involved and engaged and they didn't receive the renewal of their statutes so they were held withheld at the, at the will at the regional government and not given back so there were institutional blockages or slowness which meant that associations would struggle and were in very difficult conditions and i, I don't deny that there's been very difficult and challenging conditions in which many of these associations are working in the book details some of, some of those and how they overcame them um, the law changed in 2012 and into what associations feel, and this was in response to the Arab Spring, so-called Arab Spring, and that this idea Algeria was trying to reform at the time. Um, but this new law is contested again, and that it's adding another layer of bureaucracy, and that officially now Algerians have to have an approval. And it meant that out of these hundred thousand associations that were now registered, half of them then all of a sudden were were non-registered because they hadn't ticked the recent box, they hadn't resubmitted their statutes, or hadn't been approved. Um, which created a whole, I mean, a whole, a, a real mess, both for the state and the associations to manage. And this was incredibly complex. I mean, I was in Bleeder at the time, just after this law, and in Bleeder, they'd, they'd approved everyone. Uh, and this was because of one really dynamic person in the, in the, in the Willayan. They pushed and made sure that all of these associations had their statutes renewed and, and were pushed through. It, it's really at that level, I think we need to go to the institutions, to the regional government to see whether this is really kind of a politically motivated decision or whether it's institutional slowness, whether it's, you know, it, there are other aspects at play. Um, but there's, you know, the capacity of people to mobilize and to demand, you know, we want, we need we want our statutes back and we want them back for all of the associations in this Wilaya was possible to do in the case of Blida and, and shows this kind of development of, um, of political consciousness and awareness and holding to account, which was developing across this time. And there was a huge mobilization in 2012 against this law from associations and different networks and collectives that said, no, we, we want all our associations registered. Um, but you're right, so there's also groups that might not want to be registered as an association, they're an informal structure and they have an important role to play. And during the mobilization of 2019, it wasn't associations that were marching. Nobody marched in the name of an association, they marched as Algerians or well, they marched as Algerian women, as you rightly said, and they marched for the rights of Algerian women. And there was the Cari Feminist, there was uh, a space for women and women on the 8th of March were really at the forefront of those marches. They, they were protecting their sons and their husbands and their brothers from violence for the police. Women knew that if they were there protesting that that would change the whole dynamic of the movement. So I think you raise a really important question and that if we were doing this research now that we would need to, to engage with those organizations there's been other research by Francesco Cavatotto who looks specifically at, um, at organizations led by women who were looking at the kind of the history of the 1990s and working to support the families who've suffered. Um, so there are a whole range of associations that maybe other people have also investigated and interviewed and I didn't want to then go back and I'd bother these associations yet again, but also I thought there were other, other sectors that needed um, focus and, and engagement and exploration uh, where I had contacts. But there, um, there are also many, many fantastic Algerian researchers. I'm sure some in the room who, who will also continue that research and do that research.
moving on from 2019 onwards. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I have a couple, a couple of questions that I'm going to put together, and I have a question about Lebanon. Yeah, I'll come back to that later, if I may. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not forgetting that question. Um, so one question is about the uh, reaction and the government decisions during the Hirak. How do you, did you see that as manipulative, as responsive, or something else? Um, there's another question that uh, is uh, kind of interesting coming uh, from a comparative perspective with Tunisia, saying in Tunisia the civil society is highly polarized between Islamists and modernist civil society actors. Do you have the same type of situation in Algeria? And a related question, which is uh, the, in relation to the Hirak, um, is uh, how did you, did you see that the young people were using digital media and what role uh, they played, uh, digital media played in that movement? And there's, there's, yeah, there's uh, Elena asked a similar question. So that answers two questions at one go. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the first question about the reaction of the government and decisions which were made during the Hirak and whether these were manipulated or responsive. I think in the initial stages, I mean, you clearly see that these were responsive to the demands of the people. I mean, they could literally do nothing else. I mean, the people on the 22nd of February, millions of people took to the streets and and the state had to respond. And there was, they, they, they literally, they could no longer ignore it. They could no longer repress it. The army was not willing to repress it. Police were not willing to repress. And, and they had to respond. And each week, uh, progress, however you define progress, but you know, the decisions were made in favor of what the people were demanding. Um, but the vicar canceled the election. Then people said, that's not enough. Uh, we don't accept that you stay in power. We want you to stand down. He ultimately stood down. So every, and then the former prime minister was, was arrested on corruption charges. Ministers were arrest, arrested, business elites were arrested. Um, the people then wanted the removal of the three Bs, uh, um, the three main men in, in power at the time. And, and that happened progressively. They moved, uh, you know, the people who were requested to depart, departed. Um, so during those initial stages of the Hirak, I would believe were they manipulated? I mean, they were responsive to the demands of the people at the time, and I think there was no other choice than to do that. Um, in terms of polarization and Tunisia, um, thank you to our Tunisian colleague. Um, I think there's huge connect potential for sharing information and experience, and during some of the mobilization we had as women uh, on the 8th of March. Um, you know, there was a connection between Tunisian women and Algerian women to try to support and work together and to, to learn from each other. <laughs> in terms of polarization uh, between Islamists and, and modernists, if you described it in Algeria, um, there is a huge diversity of civil society and associations um, in Algeria, but the Hirak in particular, I feel really um, was a moment in which Algerians came together and which overcoming the divisions which previously have ravaged Algerian society. Algeria suffered so much during the 1990s because of that division, because of the split between the Islamist movement and, um, and more secular movements. And I profoundly believe from my colleagues and friends of, in Algeria that there is a very strong sense now of one Algeria and a united Algeria around the values which are Algerian ones and which are Islamic ones and which are about integrity and faith and identity as Muslims, as Algerians, whether you're secular or not, you know, you have that powerful history and culture and heritage that comes with you um, and which overrides these kind of more these fake divisions which have been manipulated in many cases to divide people when actually people are united against the real problems, which is corruption and, uh, and bad governance and the, the extractivism in Algeria and the removal of the resources. And these are questions which can bring people together, whatever you're, uh, it's not an ideological debate, we're fighting for you know, a better Algeria and for better governance of our resources and for a better future for our children, uh, whatever you're your beliefs or your specific identity or cultural heritage might be. Um, the last question on digital media. 
um, I think, you know, Algeria, if you're, if you're not on Facebook, then you're in a difficult place if you want to go and uh, make friends or travel or, or do work in Algeria. Every, there's a very, very strong prominence of Facebook and people communicate um, very regularly through Facebook or Messenger and, and there's very kind of vive debates, uh, lively debates and, um, and powerful debates. It's also possible for that to go in a, the wrong direction, as we all know. Social media can also be very damaging and quite violent in, uh, in all contexts. And I think that's you know, something that Algerians now have to manage. Um, it's a tool which can allow us to come together and to, to mobilize and to organize, uh, but it can also be quite divisive. Um, I'm not a specialist on, on digital media. We have some fantastic Algerian PhD students <clears throat> in Algeria, in the University of Jijil, who are looking at those questions who would be able to answer this better. But I think it definitely was a useful tool at the time to, to connect and to share and to document and to make an archive of these images and the, the powerful coming together of people um, during the during the mobilization. Uh, thank you. Uh, as someone working on media, I agree with you. Well, we need we need to study it. It's really central to everything we do yep. currently. Um, so we have a couple of questions coming up. One is uh, from Fozia, although the increasing number of collective associations uh, in Algeria, they still play a limited role in the implementation of real political reform. What can we do um, to try and, and improve or uh, enhance their, their uh, you know, kind of position? And from Umberto, uh, the question is about the future role of the Hirak and its relation with the military. Uh, while it has succeeded in, in helping the removal of uh, Bouteflika from power, it seems to be struggling uh, at the moment. Um, and that's the question. A few days from the constitutional referendum, does it need to does the Hirak, in your opinion, need to imagine its role in, in the Algerian society and engage more in politics? Or will its rejection of the current political framework push it to irrelevance, particularly in the context of the uh, pandemic? which is a question that came earlier um, of whether the pandemic has actually stalled or stopped the Hirak uh, from operating more effectively. Thank you for these, um, for the excellent questions. Um, Fazia, so the, the limited role, I mean, I, I would agree with you. Uh, I was talking at a very localized level often and, and terms of Azov Bayat and these non-movements and kind of very progressive political change but the in terms of real political reform and how can we enhance their position <clears throat> or how can they enhance their position I I think this is a, is, is a process it's an ongoing process and it needs to also be able to kind of to have impact and I think the kind of work that we're doing in terms of like participatory action research and looking at how we we communicate and how we we campaign for improving systems or, or challenging political decisions. Um, this is a whole skill set and and it needs it's an ecosystem. No, it's not just one organization on their own. It needs to be have an environment in which people are able to, to debate and to speak and to contribute, but also to have an impact on the political level. And if you if you look at some of the mobilization in 2012 around the law on associations and how the associations came together to discuss that law and to challenge it and then to lobby the parliament to do that and lobby members of parliament and to and then and then the first round of voting the, the law was rejected by the parliamentarians and um and challenged it and called out and then it was pushed through on a second round that, they were told to vote that way and so it, it felt like for the associations that this that this you know that, that everything they'd done they'd campaigned they brought this all together they had the information they knew that this was then just stopped at the parliament so this it's it's a wider institutional context now we need to have that relationship with members of parliament people need to be able to engage in the political system um to be able to influence to through the media i mean you have a fantastic media in algeria difficult as it is you know you have People are very brave and they speak out and they challenge decisions. Um, this is, you know, this is a hugely important part of, of democracy and political life. Uh, the role of, of, of newspapers and media online or offline. Um, 
and associations often know the problems facing people at the local level and they know the difficulties and they know the traumas that people have been through and they know how to find responses and that those responses aren't enough and it needs to be at a wide level and so if they can I think Omar Daras's point about this kind of mediated partnerships that if associations can have a little bit more support a little bit more strength a bit more kind of people support them in the community and people give um, as we've seen Algerians do so so much and they contribute in terms of solidarity to, to support other members of the community but now to consistently do that um, I think this is, is, is going to come it's going to happen the way it's happening it's, it's an emerging it's evolving it's not a one event and um, in terms of is the Hirak uh, struggling relations with the military is, is the Hirak struggling and you mentioned the constitutional referendum that's happening this, this, this weekend um, this is obviously a challenging time for Algeria and, um, and and it's a difficult period not just by one event but but the whole of this year now I mean what happens next um, this is it's a huge demand for deep and meaningful reform to the way institutions work not only with just one man in a presidency but the whole of the institutional system we want to do to, to bring it to, to bring change and to bring improvement and to make life better for people so that they can so that they can 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 be free and can and can flourish rather than battle against uh, blockages and 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 what they could, might consider to be arbitrary decisions. So, I think the Hirak was the most beautiful and powerful movement that we've seen in the world in the last year, and it inspired and was inspired from Lebanon, Sudan, but also Tunisia and the other movements across the region. Um, the Hirak is not one person, it's not an organization, it's a movement of the whole population and it's about values. Um, so, and that stays and there was, um, that, that, that doesn't disappear. If you have a movement, a movement can fall, uh, an organization, it can fall apart, it can dissipate, but those, those values stay. And this is an article that Louisa Ait Hamadouche wrote, um, I believe yesterday, uh, was it in Al Watan, um, about the Esprit de Hirak. Um, and this is, it's not about removing people from power, it's about creating the next generation of political leaders. It's about creating those new political actors who have this esprit de Hirak. <clears throat> and because we saw so many millions of Algerians marching for those values, um, you know, this, this is inherent in the Algerian population. So of course they're struggling, as we all are, <laughs> I think, in difficult contexts. And to a certain extent, we're watching our own society here in the UK becoming more and more authoritarian rather than the other direction and we all need to it's all of our responsibilities individually to, to stand up for our democracy and to fight for it consistently in the Algerian case they they have another a number of challenges and they the constitutional referendum this weekend will is one step it's one phase in this next process and we will want to see what happens uh, this weekend um, but as as Louisa Reisite Hamadou says, you know, we, this, this spirit of the, of the Hirak needs to be maintained and we need new actors to come into the political space to do that. So is there a rejection or an irre irrelevance now of the Hirak given the pandemic or has COVID stalled um, the, the movement? Um, it's obviously incredibly difficult to do, <laughs> to mobilise, to meet, to come together in the current situation. And I think that was one of the most beautiful things of the Hirak movement was the, the coming together of Algerians in public spaces and reclaiming those spaces um, for their own as a, in a struggle for fighting for a, for, for a better future. And I think that physical coming together was important. I think we all feel that, no, working on our own, in our own little boxes, uh, not meeting our colleagues, not meeting our friends at all levels of society, this kind of the separation that we feel from each other and the online and constantly looking at screens and engaging in uh, spats on Twitter. This is, you know, it's not, it's much more difficult. It's a very different way of organizing, but it's certainly not prevented Algerians from mobilizing, engaging and debating and thinking politically about the next steps. And there are many very uh, brave and in inspiring people who are continuing those debates online and who are also, you know, challenging the uh, the detainees who are, who are in, in in prison cell and trying to you know ensure that this the ongoing movement for for a 
progressive and uh, reforms within the country, th those debates are still happening and it's difficult and it's not an easy situation for Algerians and they deserve our support and understanding and not our interference. Um, um, but I believe that this is now wider than just marching in the streets. No, it's, it's about all the work that the associations were doing now. It's about building and constructing and contributing and training people and helping people and coming together in networks. And if for the moment that has to be online, I guess that has to be online. And Algeria has done the right thing in, in terms of its very strict response to the COVID virus, whether you could argue that there's kind of authoritarian tendencies across the world with people uh, locking down more in certain contexts than others. But ultimately, the number of deaths in Algeria compared to the number of deaths in the UK is significantly different uh, following this virus. So um, we certainly hope that the protection of the health services in the country and, and all of Algerians is, is prioritised as well as the important political reforms and ongoing debate that, that, that is happening and that will continue to happen. Uh, thank you. There's a couple of more questions that uh, kind of move us somewhere else. And, and the first question, I'll come back to a question by Louisa later, uh, if we have time. But the question is whether any of the organizations were collaborating with any of the Maghrebi states. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, is in light of debates about Maghrebi regional integration. Um, and the related question is, do you, is it wrong to say that Algeria is often forgotten in debates around the MENA region in general? Um, and uh, the other one, which is also related and goes back to the question by Louisa, uh, do you think there are similarities uh, between all protests, uh, sort of art, graffiti, social expression in Egypt, Lebanon, New York, and Istanbul? Um, and then we move on to the last questions in the next round. Uh, I'll come back to the question, you know, the question that uh, Louisa asked is whether you can see similarities between Algeria and Egypt right now. So if you could, you know, answer these questions in five, five minutes, if you can. <laughs> it's difficult. But you've got, you've, I'll got, do my best. you've got loads of fascinating questions coming up. So, yeah, so I'm just trying to give, you know, people the chance to have an answer to their questions. I'd be happy also to continue the debate if there's any format for doing that and answer questions if they're in the chat and on any post or blog post that you might have in the future, Dean, I'd be happy to do that if there's a way to do that. Um, in terms of collaborating with other Maghrebi states, it wasn't necessarily easy for the associations, but there were exchanges, um, in particular uh, APEB, Association pour la Protection de l'Environnement de Benisken, they were very active um, in a regional network, RADO, Réseau Associatif pour le Développement Durable des Oasis. So, and this linked Tunisia, Morocco, Mauritania, uh, France, I believe, <coughs> in, um, in a very active network. And you can Google them and see what they're doing. And they were training, um, you know, farmers across the region and sharing good good practices. They do a number of videos online. So they were connected from Gardayan and the gates of the Sahara to, to across the, the whole Maghreb region. Um, they argued that to a certain extent it was easier to work like that internationally than to nationally. And they wanted to actually connect with associations within Algeria, in Kabylia, in, in other uh, fairly similar contexts. And, and yet they, they'd been approached by this network and so that, that had worked and, and happened. But um, I'm sure that's developing more since I, you know, most of my research was done a few years ago. Every time I now travel to Algeria is mainly in more of an academic context and conferences and my academic partners in Algeria are often in Tunisia and conferences traveling across the region. So definitely I would think at an academic level, there, there are increasing connections between the Maghreb region. And the, I think that'll be really, that's a really, really interesting and important question to, to, to look at and explore further. Whether Algeria is forgotten in the MENA region. Uh, I think in the UK possibly because perhaps we have less connection to Algeria, we know less about it, um, which is um, really a shame because I think we would learn hugely from Algerian history and contemporary and less contemporary history and that we need to engage more with our Algerian colleagues. But I think the fact that there are now a number of Algerian PhD students, who I referred to in my introduction, 
Uh, 500 PhDs have been funded by the Algerian government over the last five years to study in UK universities. We have some wonderful academics, Algerian academics in UK universities um, and in academia in general, who are contributing uh, to, to sharing information about Algeria and to trying to promote more focus on the Maghreb in general, and not just Algeria, but the whole of the Maghreb region, so that um, there can be more connections between the UK uh, and the region. Um, I think in terms of similarities, I, I think this kind of creative uh, expression and the kind of creative role and intelligence and kind of humor that we saw across the region in the protests and around the Mediterranean in general, this kind of use of, of, of culture and arts and uh, different forms of representation um, definitely transcends the borders and is a such a powerful tool to, to express um, dissent in a constructive way, in a creative way, in a powerful way, and in, in, in a way that's um, umbilia, that makes, makes it beautiful. And I think that's, there were definitely similarities on that front and, and hopefully shared learning and that we can also learn from those messages that Algeria was often directing at us as well by the, you know, the internationalist kind of global critique of of capitalism and um, hydrocarbons and extractivism. So there, it's a very powerful way to give a message. Um, and I think we could definitely see that um, across the different protests in, in the region. Thank you. Is that yeah. five minutes? I know that less than five minutes, brilliant. Um, it's the creativity is so amazing. Uh, but we're also you know, learning from cre creativity of the BLM, the Black Lives Matter movement and so on. Um, so I want to bring together, you know, a few questions. One is about uh, the Hirak's leadership. Does it, you know, why do you think it doesn't have a leadership? Do you think that the Algerians believe that the new referendum is going to make a change? What role can civil society play going forward? Um, and then uh, there's one question saying that within the Hirak movement, there is some attacks on its youngsters uh, because uh, because there is a kind of a discourse that is sowing confusion that yes, it's a movement for change, but at the same time, it is trying to destroy change. So I think this question might not, you know, we might not be able to answer it today. Um, and uh, then, so if you could talk briefly about the leadership, you know, what do you think about the issue of leadership, considering that you are very reliant on uh, Bayat's notion of non-social movements. Second thing is, uh, do you believe, uh, do, you, do Algerians think that the referendum is going to make any changes and what role can uh, civil society act action and actors play in the future of Algeria? So maybe you could answer those questions and then we'll uh, draw the uh, discussion currently to an end. And as, um, and then you can, you know, maybe you can give your email if you want to to people and they can, send you some questions. Absolutely. Um, so firstly, on the question of leadership, I mean, I think the Algerians were incredibly intelligent in the initial stages and throughout because, you know, if you have one leadership, then you're highly vulnerable to being taken out and removed and um, uh, as, a, as a means of uh, attacking a movement. So the kind of the shared responsibility for this mobilization and Kind of belonging this ownership by everybody of this movement in the in from in the first months of, of the, the demonstrations and the kind of joy of being together on the streets of algiers and reclaiming that space was so profound that not one movement or one person or anyone could claim that for themselves um now obviously the, the difficulties of not having leadership then means how then do you move forward afterwards and if you succeed in your in your your goals then then where do you go afterwards but, there are, there are um, so many leaders in Algeria. You know, there, I mean, there's 100,000 registered associations, each have a president and whether well, obviously they're, they're all different and I'm not saying that they're all you know, transformational, but there are people who have experience of, 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 of activism, of solidarity, of organization, of the values that were represented in the Hirak, um, which I believe is, is just as important as having, I mean, there are, there are inspirational people within the Hirak who are deeply respected and who are protected by the population. But to, to call out one 
one person will it was the beauty and the kind of the success of the Hirak in, in avoiding that. Um, in terms of the referendum, uh, I think Algerians are now extremely astute in reading their constitution and in engaging and understanding the flaws and the meaning and what that represents in particular since the last few years. Um, there was also, I mean, there was referendum, there was a change in constitution when I lived in Algeria in 2008, which changed the constitution to allow Bouteflika Flicker to run for a second time, a third time at the time because he'd come to the end of the second mandate. And I couldn't believe it at the time, I was like, you can't just change a constitution. My Algerian colleagues were, you know, they they were very frustrated and they said, but of course you'll see, Jess, they'll change it overnight. It's no problem whatsoever to change a constitution and to change the rules. That's that's not a problem. And and I was surprised to see, yes, okay, that's that's what happened. The, the constitution was changed. And the constitution was changed into 2016 to bring back the limit of two two mandates for, for the president. <clears throat> and there were, you know, positive reforms in each time, and there was there was a debate that was run across the country about that. Now there's also forms of critique and you can be you can can challenge and, and argue whether that consultation was was inclusive and whether people were included but um my argument this is a, is a process it's not one event or one document and it's certainly not one document that that will change the way we function what matters now is is the principles and the values and the respect of the constitution once it's in place that, that the constitution is respected that there's a separation of powers of justice of the executive and you know that the principles are respected um rather than just kind of rewriting the laws uh, it's, it's easy to rewrite the laws what matters now is how those are implemented and how those are respected and that i believe is what algerians really care about and that they will fight for they will not that they will mobilize for and this brings us to the last question on civil society and that's the role then of of the the leaders within civil society rather than the hero but those people who who stand up for who challenge who, who who fight for the human rights and for for a better algeria and for for ensuring that the institutions represent the people and that they represent the values that people stood up for um in the last two years in particular but they've been doing it since 1990 as well <coughs> that those values are are taken forward and this I believe in the active civil society going beyond just the associations, but you know, the media, journalists, academics, universities, students in particular, young people have been so engaged and frustrated. I acknowledge, you know, the, the, the last question on this kind of attack on young people. I mean, it's extremely difficult to, to see the difficulties and the divisions and the manipulation, but this is to be expected. Any mobilization, any campaign will, will have these kind of attacks um down the line what matters now is kind of protecting those the values and and the integrity that people stood up for in early 2019 and i think that's what civil society will continue to to struggle for and to to work hard for in the coming years that's fantastic there were a couple of questions around the constitution, but we don't have time to take them um but uh i think on that kind of very positive note we want to thank you and there have been a few, you know, more than a few comments in the questions and answers saying what a brilliant presentation and thank you for it uh, and for your research. And uh, so, and, and we really, you know, we really appreciate what you, what, you know, your research and again, your enthusiasm and your passion uh, for uh, Algeria and its people. Uh, there was one comment from uh, Samia, uh, Samira Hamoudi, which I thought was interesting to read out. Uh, in relation to the leadership, the lack of leadership, there is no leadership because Algerians represent the unity, which is rather, rather a, a very, you know, kind of uh, informed plus uh, important comment about the unity of the people as the people. Um, so thank you, uh, Jessica, again, and thank you for uh, the uh, SOAS uh, Middle East Institute for hosting this talk. Um, and uh, for the audience, you've been really brilliant and asked so many questions and, um, you know, uh, interesting discussion, brilliant, thank you, all of these, you are brilliant. So you, you really need to, you know, kind of take that and continue your work on Algeria and hopefully we can see more of this kind of um, civil society in, in other parts of, of the region and the Arab world. 
But thanks again, and thank you all for all your fantastic questions. And looking forward to seeing you at other events. Take thank care. You. Thank bye you bye. so much, Dina. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye.